Okay, well, it is 12.01, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our most recent Local Workforce Development Area Leadership Office Hours call. It's been about a month, I think, since we all talked, so I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I am just going to say that based on the crowd today, I think there might be still something going on with the meeting invite. Might possibly be some confusion with the last uh, call as well for the MOU uh, question and answer session. So um, I'm just so you all are aware, IWD is currently in the process of converting from using Google and Gmail to um, Office 365 and Outlook. And so that is also causing some problems as we go through that conversion process like a little bit at a time, not everybody's converted. So once that, um, that transition is complete, I will probably cancel the existing um, call invitation and resend it to everybody just to kind of start fresh and make sure we're all on the same page again. So hopefully that will cut down on confusion going forward. So today, I think we all know why we're here. We're here to really just kind of talk and, and um, learn from each other and, and provide technical assistance. Today's specific talk, topics, just a couple of things. So I wanna go over some Title I funding information as we're coming up on the end of a program year and the beginning of a new one to make sure that all the local areas are prepared for that process and, and things that make sure you have everything in place to make sure we get through that smoothly. And then also just do a couple of local plan reminders. So uh, as a reminder, if at any time you have any questions, please just unmute yourself and ask or you can type them into the chat box as well. Um, I have updated this chart on our key deliverables just slightly. First of all, I put it in date order. It was bothering me that they were all sort of out of whack on, and so they're in chronological order from when due dates are approaching, and I've updated a couple of dates. So one of the processes that you're going to want to be working on um, right now and, and within the next couple of months is developing and approving a budget for program year 21, which will begin on July 1st of 21. So the deadline is not you know, a hard and fast deadline. There's nothing that you have to submit to IWD for that necessarily. It's just more of a guideline for when you would wanna have that process completed by most likely um, so that you can go into the new program year with an approved budget. Also uh, related to the new program year, by June 31st, you will have needed to either extend your existing service provider contracts beyond June 30th if they don't already go beyond that date or you're gonna to have to have uh, completed a new procurement to go into effect July 1st. So, um, you know, again, we'll get into a little bit more detail about that as we go through today's uh, information. The MOUs, as you all know, should be um, being worked on and should be completed by July 1st of 2021. And then uh, the one-stop operator guidance that has not fallen off my radar, I still have it as a thing to do and, and it's, getting closer to the top of the list. So I'm hopeful that next week I can get that out to you and, and get you some guidance on selecting one-stop operators. Again, I just wanna reassure you that when we do put that guidance out, you know, there's not gonna be a, a super fast turnaround for you to, to get that process done. You know, we're well aware that you are working on some pretty major tasks right now. So we'll make sure that that, that works for everybody. And then the local plan is on here and I did, update the deadline. The deadline was January 1st, 2022, but I thought that that was a little bit misleading because again, January 1st, 2022 is when your local plan will go into effect, but your deadline to submit it to the state is actually October 1st. And um, we're going to go over again at the end, just some reminders related to that work that you should be doing. So we'll come back to that, but I did just update that date to kind of reflect more accurately when the plan is actually due, not when it will go into effect, so. All right, let's talk about Title I funding. So obviously we have a lot of new players in the game this year as it relates to our Title I funding. We have fiscal agents that are separate entities from service providers, which has never really happened before. We have new service providers, we have new boards and new board staff, and just a lot of, of new players in the game. So I wanted to review a couple of concepts from a, at a high level and make sure that you understand why that's important for you to know and uh, make sure that you have the information you need to make sure that we get, I'm saying make sure a lot. Let me, <laughs> let me restart here. Uh, just want to ensure that you have the information you need to be successful going forward. So 
as a reminder, um, you know, the funding really flows down from the Department of Labor. And at each level, the funding flows down. There's different responsibilities, there's different uses for the funds, and there's also different time limits associated to those funds and how they can be used and how they are required to be used. And that's really important for you all at, at the local level to understand. So when the Department of Labor gives the funds to the state via IWD, uh, we receive the funds for three years. And, and that's not totally important for you to understand, but just so that you understand the way that the funding is slowing down. IWD then is required as the pass-through entity to pass the funds down to the local level. And when we give the funds to the local level, those funds are available to you all to use for two years of the funding, the first two years of the funds. Um, and then the local level, you take that money and you contract it out, whether it's through your fiscal agent to provide you their services, your, your Title I service provider probably gets the vast majority of your funding to actually provide services um, to the constituents in your local area. You'll also use funding for one-stop cert operators and your staff to the board, right? And, and so just this picture just really demonstrates again at a high level how those funds flow down and who has the funds for what year. And I think when you combine this chart with the next slide, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, so when we look at the funds in that first year that we give them to you, so we are gonna award the funds right away down to your local area. And there is a requirement in the law that the local area either expends or obligates at least 80% of the program funding within the first year of, of the funding. Okay, that's what creates that carryover funding into the second year. So right now, for all of the local areas that we sort of reset on July 1 of 2020, correct? So our program year was program year 20, fiscal year 21. So that's where we talk about PY20, FY21 funds. We are currently in the middle of the first year of that funding. It started July 1, 2020, and it will end this coming June 30th. 2021. So for the budgets that you currently have, you have to get 80% of that PY20, FY21 funding either spent or obligated by June 30th. Okay. That's because the law allows you to carry over 20% from year one to year two, which is what's demonstrated on this slide. So any of the remaining funds that aren't expended or obligated up to 20%, can be carried over by the local area and can be used in year two. So you'll often hear us refer to those as carryover funds, okay? Um, if there is more than 20% not expended or obligated by the end of the first year, IWD has the ability to pull those back and then reallocate them to another local area that did expend or obligate 80%. And that, that is built into the law on purpose to ensure that the funds are being used and that they're being used effectively and they're, they're serving people, right? Um, so obviously none of you want to lose any of your funding. So it's gonna become very important for you to ensure that you have 80% of the funds either expended or obligated by June 30th. Don't panic, I'm gonna tell you how you could do that and it's actually easier than, than you might think. Um, but just to get through the rest of this chart. So we are currently in year one of PY20, FY21 funds. When we get to July 1st of 2021, we will be in year two or the carryover year of the PY20, FY21 funds, but we will be in year one of the PY21, FY22 funds, right? So you will constantly have two different pots or two different years worth of pots of money operating at the same time, most likely, remember? Um, and then you also remember that, that this principle applies to each of the funding streams individually. So adults, DW, and youth, you, you have to look at and apply these rules separately to each of those funding streams. You don't lump it all together and say, well, we got 80% of it expended. Nope, it's did I, did I expend or obligate 80% of my adult? 80% of my DW and 80% of my youth, right? Um, 
what will happen and then you also and the fiscal agents know a lot of this for you but it's good for for all of us to understand at a high level these concepts um the the fiscal agents will ensure that you're doing what's called fifoing meaning you first in first out you spend the oldest money first so even though we're going to give you new money for py21 fy22 come july 1st ish right you're going to spend that carryover money first and you're gonna get rid of all of that before you ever start using the new money, okay? Now, if we if we continue forward with our current year, their PY20, FY21 funding, um, eventually when year three rolls around, which would be another year from now, if you haven't expend, or expended all of those funds by the end of that second year, then the state pulls them back and we um, are allowed under the law to use them for statewide activities and projects. And that's again, just designed to ensure that the funding is getting spent and that we're not sending it back because if it doesn't get spent overall by the state at the end of the three years, it goes back to the feds. And with such a little budget that, that we receive as a state of Iowa, it's really important for us to make sure that we're expending those funds uh, correctly and efficiently. So on top of that concept is just this other concept of what's the difference of an obligation and expenditure, right? And so I sort of put together this chart to help demonstrate that this is very rudimentary, very high level, and probably not super realistic when it comes to the timeframes or the funding amounts, but just to, to demonstrate where we're at. So if you think of these first three columns over here, as, as your budget beginning on July 1st of 2021 for the new money, let's talk about. So your budget for, let's say this is the adult funding stream is $100,000. That's this first blue bar here. Um, as part of your budgeting process, which I talked about at the beginning of the, of the meeting where you wanna have a budget set and approved before you go into that new program year, you as a local board, along with approval from the CEOs are going to decide what that budget looks like. So you might decide that you wanna obligate out $95,000 of that um, and keep back 5,000 of it unobligated. And if you remember to training very early on, the 95,000 is most likely gonna go into a contract with your title one service provider, right? Because they are, and your one-stop operator most likely. Um, they're the ones that are gonna be using that funding to send people to training, pay for staff to be case managers, pay for supportive services, all of those things are gonna come out of that $95,000. The $5,000 you might leave back as unobligated because there are times when your staff to the board will be doing things that they can charge to program dollars. So that might be what that $5,000 is sort of set aside for. Um, as you move through and you start spending money, you add expenditures. So when we're in July, we have just the full obligated, we've, we've, we've indicated that we are going to give $95,000 to our service provider, right? But the, the expenditure category, oops, sorry, hold on, let me go back, is still at zero because they haven't actually spent any of the money yet, right? If you go to August, you can tell by the chart that the obligation amount went down to 80,000, but the expenditures went up to 15. And if you add those up, it totals the 95,000 that was your initial obligation. So the amount of obligations you have and expenditures you have, um, and then any unobligated funds that you have should add up to your total budget at all times, right? And as your obligation or as your expenditures go up, your obligation amount will go down. So that, um, you, and then you'll eventually get to the point where you have zero obligated because you've expended it all. And this is really important for reporting because this is how the federal government requires us to report it to them, which means it's important for you to report it to us this way. And that's why the fiscal agents are so important and the, convert, uh, the um, communication and relationship between the service provider and any other contractors you have with the fiscal agent. You can see as you follow the example through that another month goes by and the obligation drops again by $20,000. You also have dropped $1,000 out of your unobligated. So that means you've spent it. So that additional um, $21,000 gets moved to the expenditures category, added to the 15,000 that was already showing in the expenditures category. And so you have, again, that sort of fluctuation as one goes down, the other goes up. 
but you're all reporting it at the same time and your budget stays consistent $100,000 the whole time. So if I get to the next screen, as a couple of quick reminders that each funding stream, adult, DW, and youth, they also have some additional reporting requirements that you have to be able to specify. And, and they're listed here. So there's that 20% minimum work experience for youth funds. There's the requirement that you spend a minimum of 75% of the youth funds on out of school youth. Um, there's a maximum of 10% that you can spend on transitional job, jobs for adult and DW. 20% max for incumbent worker training for adult and DW and a 10% max for paper performance for adult DW and youth. Let me just throw a disclaimer in here. If you hear phrases like transitional jobs, incumbent worker training and paper performance, and you say, what the heck is that? That's okay. These are um, some, some more advanced ways to use the funding that haven't typically been utilized in Iowa in the past. And so if you're not doing that right now, that's okay. It's, it's a goal for everybody to work towards. The 20% WEP and the 75% out of school youth minimums absolutely should be, be familiar to you as you're doing budgets because those are required and, and um, you'll have to meet those. And then you also have to expense out and report out training expenditures as well. So it's very important, as I said, for the service providers to be providing clear information up to the fiscal agents to, to do this reporting correctly. And I have an example um, form that your service providers could use when they are requesting either payment or reimbursement from your fiscal agents that I will send out when we're done with this call. I don't have it pulled up right now. I forgot. I'm sorry. So I can't show it to you here, but I will send that out. Some of you probably already have developed something on your own, which is great. Um, the form that I'm sending you in no way is a requirement, but is just uh, an example of a way that you could ensure the correct information is getting to the fiscal agent so that your reporting is done correctly. So that's a lot of background information to really get to this next slide, okay? So your contracts count as obligations, but for a contract to count as an obligation, it has to contain the following things. There has to be a beginning and an end date to that contract. There has to be a dollar amount associated to it and it has to extend beyond June 30th of 2021. So for example, your Title I service provider contracts are most likely the contract that is going to get your obligation rates to be above that 80% in the first year of the funding. Um, but if you don't have a dollar amount attached to that contract, then, then there's no way to determine what the obligation is and it doesn't count. It basically means the money is just sitting at the local board and, and it doesn't count as obligated. And then you would be possibly looking at having to give those funds back if you, if you haven't um, obligated them or expended them. I, I know just from talking to several different um, of the staff to the board and, and people that some of your contracts most likely need to be corrected. That's okay. You can do that by doing amendments by ensuring that all of these things are included in those contracts with your service providers. Um, I think that there were some questions surrounding, you know, the dollar amount issue. And you have to think about it like this. You all were required to put out a, an RFP to get a Title I service provider, right? And on that RFP, there was a dollar amount associated to it. There had to be. Well, the dollar amount that it was in that RFP most likely should be the dollar amount that ends up in the contract that you have with that service provider. And therefore you um, can count it as an obligation and it's reported up as an obligation. Um, so again, as long as you have 80% of that first year's funding, so the funding that you currently have is, is in a contract by June 30th that goes in the contract extends beyond June 30th, most likely through June 30th of 2022, for example, then you will meet that requirement and you would not be looking at um, sending any money back. So the other thing to point out about your contracts is that your fiscal agents should always have a copy of every contract that your board has um, that includes funding because they are responsible, most likely if, if it's in their contract with you, and it should be, um, for, for ensuring that the expenses that they are paying and that the funds that are being used against those contracts are being done correctly. The only way they can do that is if they have copies of all the contracts. 
um, every modification, everything that's done. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Okay. And you guys, can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I got a message, Jana, I, I will absolutely, I mean, I will be sharing the recording of this call and the slide deck. I'll post it on the state board website where we post all of them. Early I appreciate night. it. Yeah. I, did, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll wait. No problem. Um, okay. So with all of that, let me pause before I get into this screen. Any questions, comments, concerns? Um, I do have to say that this is a concept that it takes several times hearing it before it clicks. So if, if, it, if you've heard it once and you're going, oh Lord, I'm never gonna get this, trust me, we've all been there, it's okay. Um, and, and we will continue to sort of repeat these things and help you through this because we don't want you returning funds, right? We, the funds are, the budget is based off of the data that tells us where the funding should go in the state. And so based on that, I believe that the allocation is correct and that, that everybody has the proper amount of funding to serve their constituents. So we want that money to stay where it is and for you to be able to use it to serve your constituents and not have to worry about um, returning it. This, if as long as these contracts are correct, then we should have no problem ever of you all individually meeting that 80% expenditure requirement and we really shouldn't have to worry about uh, returning funds or anything like that. So any questions before I, I go on to some more specifics about our current contracts? Hey, Michelle, it's Miranda. So when we talk about extending the contracts, can we just do an amendment to the original contract? Just that one page document stating that you know, we're extending it through June 30th, 2022, and this is the amount? Absolutely, yep. Right. So Thanks. all you have to do is, I mean, well, okay, let me back up Miranda. <laughs> let me tell you how we would do it. For the, for the IWD master agreements that we have with the fiscal agents and the CLEOs and the board, right? That's what we will do. We will do a modification that just extends the period of performance of that grant, right? Assuming the contract that you used to put in place with your service provider is similar, then yes, that's all you would have to do. But you have to follow the um, requirements of the contract that you put forth, right? So like, for example, when we put in a place a master agreement with the fiscal agents for these Title I funds, we said that it was a year long contract with the possibility to extend up to five times, right? So we will be going on to our first extension. If you put in a contract with a service provider that says it's a year long contract and we can expend, extend possibly two years, right? Then you could only extend it twice and then you would have to complete a new RFP, right? Things like that. So as long as it is within the um, context of the contract you have, then yes, you should be able to just modify it to extend the period of performance. Okay, so let's talk about the actual modifications that are coming your way. I sent an email about this last week, but I just figured it's easier to talk about too, since we have time. So first of all, you remember last year when we talked about giving all the local areas rapid response additional assistance funds, and it was $36,000 per old region, right? So if you were Central Iowa, which you were the same before as you are now, you got $36,000, end of story. For example, Northeast Iowa, who had three separate service provider contracts going until this most recent December 31st, each of those old contracts got $36,000. But they didn't all, those old contracts, they didn't spend it all down. So let's say they're still combined, you know, $30,000 left. We are taking that money that the old contracts did not spend and putting it into a new contract with the fiscal agent to give you the remainder of those funds. So those are separate contracts that will be coming through for, I believe, every local area except for Southwest. And Southwest, it's because the $36,000 that was in contract with the previous service provider contract was all expended. So there won't be one for Southwest. Everybody else will get that new contract. Western, 
Northwestern, Northwest, and Mississippi Valley, you guys already had a contract because you started using your fiscal agent July 1. So for you, you're going to get a modification that extends your ability to use those funds through December 31st. And then everybody else who's getting a new contract, you can use those funds through December 31st. Um, when it relates to the formula funds contracts, so again, sort of the same thing with that example with Northeast Iowa, there were formula funds into contract with the old service providers that ended December 31st. Now that that closeout period is done and we know how much to the penny they did not spend, those formula funds for PY20, FY21 will get put into the formula, uh, the master agreement with the fiscal agent, along with any carryover from the previous year that they did not spend. So those will be coming. We are also adding additional FY21 dislocated worker funds to all local areas. So we're increasing your overall DW budget for the year. Um, that will include additional administration funds and program funds. So that's a great thing. We also will be doing modifications to extend all of those contracts through July 1 or through June 30, 2022, I should say. But um, and then we also are required by federal law to add some Buy American and Veterans Priority provision language directly to the contract. This language was already incorporated into the contracts through the um, terms and conditions, which were an incorporated document, but the state auditor is saying that we have to specifically put that language directly in the contract. So we're gonna add that in. And once those should all be coming probably next week, I would think. And then again, when the PY20, FY21 formula funds are available, we will be doing new modifications to add that funding in for you as well. The earliest possible date that could happen would be July 1st. Um, typically doesn't happen right on July 1st because we have to actually receive the funds from the feds before we can contract it to you. And they are notoriously slow about getting those funds to us on time. So we give you those as soon as we possibly can. Now we will, we should be, fingers crossed, getting um, final confirmation from the feds any day now about what our allotments are for the year as a state. When we get those, we will run them through the allocation formula funds and we'll be able to send out information to you all so that you know what your budget will be for PY21, FY22. And you can go through that budgeting process that we mentioned at the beginning of the call. Um, so you'll know ahead of time what your your budget is, what your available funds are so that you can create your budget. Um, and then you will actually get the funds through modification as soon as they're available. So one of the things that we are also doing next Monday is our next um, local board chair technical assistance call. And we're gonna be doing a little bit more of a deep dive with the board chair specifically on um, what that budgeting process could look like. So they'll be able to um, help you out because that is really a responsibility of the board. And then the CLIO gives final approval for that, for, for that budget. So lots of, lots of financial stuff coming up in the next couple of months. And this will be the typical process for every year about this time going forward. We start doing all of this budgeting and funding and carryover and all sorts of stuff. So, Okay. That was really all I wanted to talk about from a, a funding perspective. Are there any other questions or thoughts before we move on? Hi, Michelle. Hi. Michelle. Hi. Again. Hi. 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 Um, so do you have any idea how much dislocated worker funds each area will be getting? Because we were looking at transferring some of our um, dislocated worker dollars to adult. Uh-huh. Um, oh gosh, I can, yes, I do know, not off the top of my head. It's, I can't, I, yeah, I can't even pull a number out just to kind of give you a ballpark. When I'm done, I will send to the chairs what those amounts are. Okay, and we do have to have that request in by April 30th, right, to transfer from DW to adult? Yep, absolutely. And so, again, for, for those of you just a little bit of background for the rest of you listening in. The law allows for you to transfer funding from between the adult and DW funding streams um, every year. And, and so you might wanna do that to help you meet that 80% requirement. You might wanna do that because you don't have very many dislocated workers, but you have a lot of adults that you could serve. I mean, kind of vice versa, right? 
And um, when you do that, the one thing that you have to remember is that the 80% uh, expended or obligated requirement for the first year of funds is based off of your total DW budget or your total adult budget for the year. So when you shift those funds around, then um, that will shift that 80% amount as well, right? So for example, if you had $100 in adults and $100 in DW, you're required to obligate or expend $80 of it by June 30th, right? Well, if you shift um, $50 from adult to DW, you now have to expend 80% um, of 50 for adults. So you'd only have to have expended 40, is it $40? Do somebody can do math off the top of their head better than I can by, you know, to meet that 80% threshold. And then you have to expend 80% of the 150 on the DW side. So that's just the one thing to keep in mind with that. But yep, we need to have those requests by April 30th. So what does that request process look like? What um, do we need to do? On the phone, I believe, wasn't there a form attached to the field memo that we sent out that you can use? Yes, that's true, Michelle. Okay. Yeah, just all you have to do is use that form, Miranda, and submit it. And then um, there, that form does require the board chair and the CLIO approve that, obviously. So, okay. And is that on the, the e-policy site? Because I don't remember seeing it. I'm sure I got it, but I don't know where it is. Okay. So can I access? Yeah, okay. it's, I, I think I emailed it out and it is on e-policy. Okay. All right. Thanks. Just let me know if you have any questions, though, and I can help you. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Okay, let's do a couple quick reminders about the local plans. So again, at the beginning of the meeting, when I reviewed the, the chart of upcoming tasks, I had updated the due date for that local plan. And if you remember from the guidance, the local plans have to be submitted to the state and approved. Um, and that de deadline is October 1st. Sounds far away but it's not when you think about the other requirements for you in that planning process. And the biggest one is that you have to post your um, plan for public comment period of 30 days prior to you submitting it to the state for approval. So if you're gonna meet that October 1st deadline to submit for approval, then you need to be posting your local plan for public comment probably no later than around August 15th so that you have time to receive any comments and address them, possibly make changes to your local plan. Um, and then those questions you received as a part of the public comment period have to be submitted with the local plan for approval. So if you, know, if you think about that, you really only have until around August 15th to have a final local plan ready to go. And so again, it's already, what, April 16th. So you're just looking at a few months. And so I just wanted to Put a plug in again that that um, if you haven't started, you do need to start working on that. Um, I'm sorry, that means you wonderful board chairs, or I'm sorry, board staff have a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that you're, you know, you're already working on that. But I was able also to earlier this week, I think, was it earlier this week? Gosh, send out the labor market information for each of the local areas. I sent that directly to the board staff because they were really big files. So. Um, if you didn't get it, let me know. And if you have any questions, obviously we can reach out to the labor market information division and get you any assistance with that that you need. So that was my last reminder about that. Are there any other questions or topics that, that um, everybody wants to discuss or anybody wants to discuss? Lori, I know that you were able to join us. Is there anything you can think of to add to what we talked about today or correct that I said wrong? No, I don't have anything. I, no, there's no corrections to be made. No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, then I will, like I said, get the recording of this and the slide deck posted um, probably ne early next week. 
And as always, if you have any questions, um, you know, our financial management team has also been in close contact with your fiscal agents. So this information has been shared with them as well. And they should have uh, what they need to move forward and make sure that they're reporting out their obligations and expenditures for you correctly. Um, but again, this is, this is going to take all of us working together. So if you have any questions, please let me know. And we will make sure that you, you have what you need to, to keep the money where it needs to stay. And you, you're getting it expended um, to, to serve your participants. So thank you, guys. I hope you all have a great weekend. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye.